I, I wanted to talk about the survival of democracy in America and around the world. This is, um, I think, the biggest, frankly, of all the issues that we're facing, you know, war and peace and, and uh, you know, uh, economic inequality and, and uh, uh, you know, trying to turn America into a functioning uh, first world country with a national health care system and good education and all those other things. Those, those are all important. But we can't do any of that if we don't maintain a, a democracy and and uh, to the extent that we have one right now. So I just wanted to track the arc of the destruction of our democracy, because I think that within that we can find the uh, the seeds of its resurrection. The you know, if you understand where you're where you came from, you can uh, sometimes figure out how to get back to to uh, well and, and, and reverse some of the problems. Um, <clears throat> back in the in the um, back in the in the late 1800s, after you know, long after the Civil War, gener two generations after the Civil War, uh, with the Industrial Revolution, we saw this rise of basically a new oligarchy in the United States. Um, the previous oligarchy had been in the early 1800s, and that had been in the South, the the, uh, the cotton oligarchs, and they. Uh, this was America's first experience of fascism, the cotton oligarchs in the South uh, around, uh, well, it was in 1797, actually, that Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, but um, it wasn't popularized and he, he didn't, he, he got some money from an investor and was able to market the thing in the 18 teens. And so by 18, the 1820s, 1830s, uh, one cotton gin could do the work of 50 enslaved people in cleaning cotton, which was the most labor intensive part of, of cotton production, because there's all these little seeds that are really hard to pull out. And, but it was very expensive. And so what happened was there were basically about a thousand plantations in the South that could afford these machines. And once a plantation had one, they could wipe out all of their local competitors because they were so much more efficient. And so this thousand families, more or less, ended up owning the southern states and they suppressed political dissent. Uh, you know, uh, obviously they were suppressing slave rebellions and things like that. But um, they they uh, they basically turned the south into a fascist state. No, no opposition was allowed. If you ran against them in political campaigns, you, you, you could get killed. Your house would be burned down. Um, the people were imprisoned on false charges. I mean, it was a genuine police state, the South, uh, in between the period of 1835, mostly until, uh, you know, until the Civil War. We fought that oligarchy. That oligarchy declared war on the United States, said we don't want democracy in the United States anymore. We want we want a, a fascist state. We want we want to be ruled by, you know, a thousand wealthy families, an oligarchy. And, you know, we fought them back and, and defeated them. The second rise of oligarchy was in the 1880s with the, you know, following the Industrial Revolution. And this was, you know, the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers and, and you know, the steel barons and the chemical barons, the DuPonts and the, you know, et cetera, the banking families and all this stuff, the 1880s through the 1910s, 1920s. And <clears throat> there, there was a significant pushback to them. And that was in 1890 uh, at the federal level. Well, actually, in 1880. Eight, I believe it was, in Grover Cleveland's second inaugural address, he came right out and said it. Um, the only Democrat to have been elected in in the last half of the 18, 1800s, um, he said the the uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying, I'm struggling to remember the exact words, but anyhow, his his words were to the effect of, uh, you know, one of the more picturesque uh, phrases he used. He said, "The Iron Heel." of uh, the industrialists is upon the neck of the average American citizen. And, uh, you know, it was, oh, and he said, we're seeing, you know, combines and trusts and monopolies that are crushing the spirit of independence in America. I mean, he came right out and said it. This led in 1890 to the passage of the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, which really wasn't enforced until 1903 by, by Teddy Roosevelt. And he picked up that uh, banner, uh, progressive Republican. Um, because there was a widespread sentiment against the oligarchs across the United States, and that that you know brought uh, Roosevelt his reelection, and uh, you know, brought Taft into power. Taft was a progressive Republican as well who followed Roosevelt, and 
you know, they took a big bite out of, uh, you know, they broke Standard Oil up into 36 companies. They they uh, they went after a bunch of them. Uh, that that anti-oligarchy movement um, suffered a, a significant setback in 1920 when Warren Harding ran for president, the Republican. Um, and uh, he his he had two slogans that he ran on. One was a return to normalcy. And what that meant was uh, reversing uh, Woodrow Wilson's 91 percent top income tax rate, taking it down to 25 percent. And his second slogan was more business in government, less government in business, which meant privatize and deregulate. And when he was elected, he did these things. He dropped the top tax rate down to 25 percent. He uh, did massive deregulation chopped up government agencies, uh, elevated oligarchs. Um, and the, the result of that was the Republican, you know, the great crash of October 1929 and the Republican Great Depression, which led us into an era from the 1930s with the election of Franklin Roosevelt in 1932 up until 1981, really, an era of uh, suppression of oligarchy. And the main instrument of that suppression was a top tax rate of 92 percent and uh, which sustained through most of that period of time. Lyndon Johnson dropped it down to 70 percent in, in 1967. Um, but he closed so many loopholes in the process, at least on the morbidly rich, that uh, he actually <laughs> increased federal revenues. Um, uh, without pointing out that it was because he closed loopholes, by the way, the, the Reaganistas used to say, well, you know, when, when uh, LBJ dropped income taxes from 91 to 70 percent, the revenues went up. Well, it's because he closed all these loopholes. But anyway, um, so, you know, that was kind of this is kind of the, the arc of oligarchy and, and the confrontation between the, the, the morbidly rich in the United States and and democracy. Up until the up until the 80s, but a, a, a really where our story begins now, the modern story, was in 1976. In 1976, uh, five five members of the U.S. Supreme Court actually actually it might have been six of the U.S. Supreme Court ruled for the first time in the history of the developed world, not just the United States, but in the first time in the history of the developed world, ruled that rich people because of campaign finance limitations. And there were a whole bunch of them. In 1909, uh, Harry, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt got passed the, the Tillman Act, which made it a federal felony for any corporation or any officer of any corporation to give any, or any lawyer for any corporation to give any money at all to any political campaign that was for federal office. Um, uh, more, more than half of the states had similar laws on the books. Uh, that you know that that dated back to the to 1909 to, to the to the to the to the Teddy Roosevelt era, and then in in uh, 1974 after the Nixon bribery scandals, I mean Agnew, you know everybody remembers Agnew got left for taking bribes. Most people don't remember that Richard Nixon took a million dollar bribe from Jimmy Hoffa, and he took a half a million dollar bribe, both in cash, by the way, delivered in suitcases to the White House from the milk lobby. And so in the wake of these bribery scandals, the Church Commission and others put together some really stringent uh, campaign finance reforms in 74 and 75. So in 76, pushing back against that, the, the Supreme Court said, uh, you have limited the ability of rich people to speak about politics in a way that we think is unconstitutional. It's a violation of the First Amendment right of free speech. And they, they made the claim absurd as it sounds now, that money is necessary for political speech, that in the era of television and radio and ads and newspapers, national newspapers and things like this, that, that you know, uh, you can't really speak about politics in, with a loud voice unless you can buy advertising. And so what they concluded was that money was the same thing as speech and therefore was protected by the First Amendment. The, the effect of that, of course, was that, you know, if you've got 30 million bucks and you want to spend a million of it on politics, you have, you know, a million dollars worth of political speech. Uh, if you're an average person, you know, you and me, um, you know, you might be able to spend 50 bucks uh, or stand on the street corner and proclaim your your uh, your political position. But uh, 
But nonetheless, the Supreme Court said that those poor rich people were de being deprived of their right to, to engage in public speech. Two years later, Lewis Powell, who had been put on the court in 72 by Richard Nixon, he wrote the Powell Memo in 71, uh, which was a blueprint for uh, wealthy people to take over the, the government of the United States. Uh, two years later, in 1978, Lewis Powell wrote the decision. He was on the Supreme Court, wrote the decision uh, in, the, in a case called First National Bank versus Bellotti. Frank Bellotti was the attorney general for Massachusetts. Massachusetts had laws on the books that said corporations could not engage in political activity unless it had something to do with their business. Uh, in other words, they could lobby, but that was it. And uh, the First National Bank of Boston had donated money to an anti-abortion campaign, oddly enough. And uh, they got busted for it. Bellotti busted them. So they sued all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, Lewis Powell ruled in that or wrote the decision in that case saying that uh, corporations are persons under the under the Constitution. As persons, they're entitled to human rights uh, enumer enumerated in the, the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. And that includes the First Amendment, the right of free speech. So corporations have the right to buy politicians just like, you know, the morbidly rich. This legalization of political bribery. Um, was largely ignored by the Democratic Party at the time. The Democrats at that time, you know, a third of America was unionized. And uh, the Democratic Party, if anything, was had too much money. I mean, they were rolling in cash, <clears throat> the Kennedy era and whatnot. And, you know, from the unions uh, to the point that, and the unions were rolling in cash to the point that a lot of the unions had become fairly corrupt. You know, the, the corruption of Jimmy Hoff and all that everybody's familiar with and Frank Fitzsimmons and et cetera. So uh, the Democrats largely ignored this, but the Republicans uh, in 79, uh, the decision came down late 78. In 79, the, the, the Republicans said, uh, we'll take your money. <laughs> you know? Yeah, here's our hand. And uh, this was the essence of the Reagan campaign. The Reagan campaign explicitly reached out to the fossil fuel industry and said, you know, you fund our campaign and we'll, we'll do good by you. And uh, so, you know, Reagan became president uh, with the election of 1980. He was sworn in on January 20th, 1981. Uh, at the very moment he put his hand on the Bible was when the hostages were released. We now know that Reagan had committed treason. He had cut a deal with the Iranians to hold the American hostages to screw Jimmy Carter. But uh, anyhow, this was the beginning of the Republican Party's embrace of oligarchy. Prior to that, the Republican Party had not really been the party of oligarchs. I mean, you know, setting aside, notwithstanding Warren Harding and, and, and Coolidge and, and Hoover, I mean, they had their, their little tryst with oligarchy, but um, it blew up in their face with the Republican Great Depression. So, uh, you know, they had kind of walked away from that. Uh, Eisenhower, you know, was quite happy with a 92% top tax rate, which is what it was at in 1956 when he ran for re-election. Um, uh, Nixon, you know, was happy with a 90% tax rate. Well, actually, it was 70% by then because LBJ had lowered it, but he was fine with that. Um, but when Reagan came into power, the, he basically asked the oligarchs, you know, the American oligarchs, what do you want? And they said, we don't want to pay taxes anymore. And he said, OK, we'll make that happen. And uh, in the process, drove up the uh, drove up the national debt of the United States. He when he came into office, the national debt of the United States was a little under eight hundred billion dollars. And when he left, it was a little under two point four trillion dollars. He more than tripled the national debt of the United States in eight years. Um, he was following a pattern that had been laid out by a political consultant, a, a Republican political consultant named Jude Winiski who published in 1977 in the Wall Street Journal an article about the two Santa Claus theory. And what June Wininsky said was, and keep in mind, at this point in time, Democrats had not, or Republicans, excuse me, had not controlled the House of Representatives since the 1930s, with the exception of a two-year period, 46-47, or 47-48, I guess it would be, when, uh, you know, they jammed Traff, Taft Hartley down Harry Truman's throat. So, you know, the Republicans were, you know, out in the wilderness, uh, basically, even in the 80s. So, uh, you know, the bottom line was that this was the, the, the Republicans embrace, a uh, big time embrace of oligarchy and the beginning of the process of setting aside democracy, essentially. And, uh, you know, uh, oh, June Wininsky, uh, Jude Wininsky's uh, Two Santa Claus Theory, he argued that uh, Democrats were always seen as Santa, right? Uh, the, at the New Deal and the Great Society had brought us 
uh, unemployment insurance and social security and Medicare and Medicaid and uh, uh, you know time off work for sickness and unionization. And I mean, you know, we could go through the long list of all the things that the Democrats have done. And the Republicans had opposed every single one of them. And so what Waninsky said in the, in the Wall Street Journal in 97 or in 77 was the Republicans are viewed as Scrooge. And so we have two things we have to do. Number one, we have to uh, be viewed as Santa Claus. We have to come up with some area where we can be Santa Claus because the Democrats are the Santa Claus. I mean, they gave everybody Social Security and they gave Medicare and they get, you know, the, the Democrats are just throwing things at people. And number two, the number two imperative is to force the Democrats to shoot their own Santa in the face. Uh, the biggest part of their own Santa being the, the uh, what we call the, the uh, uh, you know, Social Security, Medicare, the the, the programs the, the, that are, you know, the basis of the New Deal, entitlement programs. And <clears throat> so the way that Wininsky suggested that Republicans could do this to Democrats was when a Republican becomes president, spend money like a drunken sailor. This will do two things. Number one, it'll drive up the national debt. And we'll get to that in a minute. And number two, it'll stimulate the economy which will cause people to think, hey, those Republicans really know how to have a great economy. Um, you know, I used to make jokes back in the 80s when I would debate politics with friends. And I, you know, they'd say, oh, this Reagan economy sure is great. And I'd say, you know, give me a two and a half trillion dollar credit card and I can show you what good times look like. Because that's what he did. You know, he, he, he put almost two trillion dollars on the national credit card. So uh, Reagan followed that policy. And then the second part of Wininsky's policy was when that's when a Republican is on. Whenever a Democrat is in office, what Republicans need to do is scream and squeal and yell as loudly as possible at the national debt. The national debt is a threat to America. It's our children in chains. You know, uh, when when even had you know suggested phrases like that. In fact, you heard if you if you caught uh, MAGA Mike uh, Johnson's press conference this morning, he he was literally quoting some of uh, Jude Wininsky's stuff when he said, you know, we're we're we have to be fiscally responsible and. I mean, even he was even engaging in just some outrageous BS. You know, he said, I've talked to military people who say the biggest threat to America isn't China or Russia. It's our national debt. So anyhow, this is this is what we saw is what we saw with the Reagan administration. Uh, we saw this with the Bush administration. Uh, you know, Reagan's tax cuts in aggregate now over a 40 year period have added, you know, at least 12 trillion dollars to the national debt. Bush's tax cuts and his two wars, his two wars cost us seven or eight trillion dollars. His tax cuts have cost us another five trillion, roughly. And then uh, Trump's tax cuts added another four or five trillion in aggregate. I mean, the, the immediate impact was two trillion, one point seven trillion. And you know, so now we're at thirty three and a half percent, thirty three and a half trillion dollars is our national debt, one hundred and thirty percent of GDP, roughly. And so, you know, here we are. The Republicans have figured out now over the last, well, in large part since the election of Obama, I think, um, that the policies that they're promoting, I mean, they're still Scrooge, right, the, of privatizing Social Security and Medicare, uh, cutting taxes on billionaires, um, you know, opposing any kind of social programs, their opposition to abortion, of course. Um, that these are very unpopular. And so they basically just said, screw democracy. You know, we're going to go with gerrymandering and voter suppression and and uh, and building a coalition of uh, a whole bunch of little groups that we can jam together into a giant coalition. We'll take some misogynists over here and we'll take some, hate, you know, uh, 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 homophobes here and we'll take the, the racists here and we'll, you know, it's, it we'll take the gun nuts here. And uh, the anti-science people, the religious uh, fundamentalists, and we'll just, you know, jam them all together and, you know, basically pander to all of them, but not really serve any of them. The only the only groups that the Republican Party right now are adequately serving are are the billionaires and the monopolistic corporations, the largest American corporations. And the impact that this has had, uh, this open, naked bribery of American politicians. I mean, you know, it, it, people are so cynical right now about our politics and so discouraged about our politics. And when you ask them why, they'll say, because everybody's on the take, you know? I mean, you do a survey of what Americans want 
and you find that more than 70% of Americans want Social Security strengthened, want Medicare strengthened, want a national health care system like Canada has, want free college education, want to end all the student debt that we're all carrying, want to do something about giant corporations ripping us off 16 ways to Sunday, want the right to unionize in every state. I mean, I, the list actually goes on from there, but you get the point. And everybody knows that everybody wants this and everybody knows that none of it's happening and none of it's happening is because of political bribery, because of these three Supreme Court decisions, you know, Buckley versus Baleo in 76, First National Bank versus Bilotti in 78 and Citizens United in 2010. And this cynicism, this this, you know, looking around and going, holy, holy cow, we're just, you know, we've been, you know, our, our politicians are being bought out left and right. The cynicism is is causing people to turn away from democracy, and it's causing people to actually embrace fascism, to embrace systems of government that don't involve democracy, because, you know, the, the sales pitch of the fascists, of the, the Trump faction is, you know, that democracy didn't work out all that well for you. And we've got an alternative system. You know, it's Vladimir Putin pioneered it in Russia. Uh, Viktor Orban is doing it in Hungary right now. Um, he has turned all the media in the country, every, all of the major media in Hungary now is the equivalent of Fox News. It, it sings the praises of Viktor Orban 24-7 because he, you know, he passed some, some libel laws, which, by the way, the Republicans in the Senate are really working on right now. They're trying to get these passed, um, you know, blowing up Times v. Sullivan. In fact, there's going to be a challenge to Times v. Sullivan before the Supreme Court in all probability in the next term, um, uh, which was the case that said that you that if you're a political figure, you can't sue for libel. Uh, you know, if I if I go on the radio and I say, or even, you know, just in any public venue, say, you know, Ted Cruz's, you know, Ted Cruz's dad killed Kennedy. Um, Ted Cruz can't can't sue me. But if they can overturn Times v. Sullivan, then Ted Cruz could sue me. So that's what Victor Orban did is he he changed those laws so that people could sue and then and then just started suing like crazy and putting all these media operations out of business. And then when they went bankrupt, they, he uh, organized it so that his oligarch buddies bought them. So his uh, oligarchs own all the media in Hungary. They own all the major corporations in Hungary. He gerrymandered radically the Hungarian country to the point that his party, his Fidesz party, is never going to lose another election. And, you know, and then he came over to Texas last year, the year before last, and spoke at CPAC and said, you guys need to do here in America what we've done in Hungary. And he got a standing ovation for that from you know an all republican crowd so you know they basically abandoned democracy as an operating principle for their party so the question then is you know what do we do about this how how can we is it even possible to come back from this and i think that we have to go back to first principles in this conversation and that is that the i mean we can talk all day long about you know how yeah, the insurrections and terrible politicians and Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and, you know, uh, Tommy Tuberville tearing our military apart and all these other, you know, uh, grievances that we can identify. But the, the core cancer, excuse me, the first cancer that metastasized through our entire system were those three Supreme Court decisions, legalizing political bribery. And we really need to be reversing those. We, we And there are several ways to do this. One way would be to change the composition of the Supreme Court. Um, you could do that by expanding the court or with term limits. So term limits would take a lot longer, but uh, that's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is for Congress to simply pass a law. Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution says that the Supreme Court shall operate under regulations and with exceptions as defined by Congress. And Congress has on numerous occasions passed laws. In fact, the the uh, the legislation that kept the government open had a provision in it that said that the Supreme Court can't rule on the constitutionality of this law. It's right there. It's right there in the in the law. There have been over 100 laws passed that have that paragraph in them. It's never been used. It it, it has never been tested, but it's called court stripping. Um, but it you know, it has a solid legal basis and has has been done in many states. So uh, arguably Congress could pass a law saying that corporations are not persons, money is not speech, and the Supreme Court cannot contradict us. Uh, it would create a constitutional crisis, but I think it would create a very healthy one. And, you know, we 
we have to figure out what we're going to do with that. But that's that's the essence of of the problems that I'm seeing is that you know right now our political system is being run by a handful you know probably fifteen or twenty right wing billionaires, and and uh, you know a, a couple of hundred major corporations, uh, members of the Business Roundtable and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who are extremely politically active and who spread money around Washington D.C. the way the farmers in Iowa spread manure around. So. You know, that that in my mind is job one, and that's where we really need to begin. So you asked me for 30 minutes. There you go. How's that?